Okay, we'll start with this, I'm sure. Most of you have heard by now. News broke earlier today that Terrence Crawford has now been made WBC welterweight champion in recess. Crawford is set to face Israel Madrimov for his WBA super welterweight world title on August 3rd. Now also a WBC final eliminator to determine the mandatory challenger for Sebastian Fundoria versus Errol Spence. What do I think about this news? Why would the World Boxing Council move to do this? Move to make Terrence Crawford rather the winner of Crawford versus Madrimov of the mandatory for the winner of Fundora versus Spence. Money. The short answer is money. Saudi money. The cash injections that Turkey Al Al Sheikh is making into the sport of boxing, his investment in Terence Crawford. Most people are picking Terence Crawford to win the Madrimov fight, right? Right. And His Excellency is so invested in the career of Terence Crawford, he's bankrolling that show. He's paying for it. Coincidentally, the World Boxing Council is in bed with His Excellency. They have a partnership of some kind. So you see the strategy. Turkey Al Al Sheikh is in the Terence Crawford business, and in many ways, so is the World Boxing Council. Follow the money. You don't normally see this. This level of augmentation for what already is a world title fight. It's for Israel's WBA title. You want to make that a WBC final eliminator? Many times can you remember where what was already a world title fight was also billed as a final eliminator for yet another title. How many times have you seen that happen? Because I've been watching boxing a long time and I've never seen that. I can't recall. But I'm not against it. I'm not. Because as I stated in a previous video, you can't get Spence versus Fundora unless both Spence and Fundora duck Terence first. To make a fight with each other, you have to avoid him. It's the only way it happens. Spence had a rematch clause if he wanted to run it back with Terence. He did. Clearly he didn't. Sebastian, Sebastian knew upon winning that WBO title, you'd have to fight Terence Crawford next. He's your mandatory because he's WBO super champion. And upon moving up in weight, that designation allows him to be your problem. Your promoter might not have wanted that, but your promoter ain't got the inside track with the WBC like Turkey has the inside track with the WBC. Spence wasn't even ranked in the WBC 154 pounds. How the hell is he number one today? You may be excited about, you know, Spence possibly getting back in the ring with Crawford. But I see this as another way of them trying to ice out my man Crawford. They are not going to give him the opportunity for that man to make history undisputed in three weight classes. So you may see it as good news. I see it as bad news. Yeah, maybe it was. Maybe it was bad news up until this point. But news happens fast in the sport of boxing. I don't disagree with the caller. I don't disagree with Jerry Soriano, your lender for life. I like him feel that Spence versus Fundora was a clandestine effort to freeze Terence Crawford out of the junior middleweight division and at least two alphabet titles. That's what they were trying to do with that fight. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to freeze him out again. Just didn't work. Because as the old saying goes, money talks and bullshit walks. Or it rides the bus. I saw a jubilant group of individuals so happy, so elated, that Errol Spence Jr., having done absolutely nothing at 154 pounds, was given a number one rank by the World Boxing Council not that long ago. He's currently ranked at number one, coming right off that demoralizing beating to Terence Crawford. And these guys were okay with that. So, if you were okay with that, then you should be okay with this. That if it's okay for Errol to be ranked at number one, having done nothing at this weight, then surely the man who beat him deserves some consideration as well. It's chicanery. It's chicanery on both ends. It's chicanery on the part of Spence. It's chicanery on the part of Crawford. But what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Fair play. If Crawford wins, he becomes the mandatory challenger to the winner of Spence versus Fundora. So what are you guys gonna do? What are you gonna do now? What? When the time comes, are you going to vacate that title too? We all know you're about to vacate the WBO title. We all know you're about to do that. But when the time comes, are you going to vacate the green one too? Are you going to vacate the WBC title to get out of this fight? Because we know you don't want it. We know you don't want to fight Terrence Crawford. Errol didn't want a rematch, and Sebastian, rather Sebastian's promoter, he didn't want him to fight Crawford either. Clandestinely, what I see is that the effort is being made behind the scenes to keep Terrence in a pole position to land the best fights, with the best fighters at this weight. That's what's going on. Much to the chagrin of many a PBC fan, 
PBC acolytes, PBC fighters and their affiliate promoters, much to their chagrin, an effort is being made to ensure that Terrence gets the fights he wants and the fights he needs for his legacy. Because now the chicanery works both ways. But alas, there is another affected party by all of this, and that is the Ukraine's own Sergei Bohachuk, who earlier this year became the WBC interim champion at this weight, and theoretically the mandatory challenger to the WBC title, but I guess not. What do you mean you guess? You said it yourself. He's not getting that Fundora fight. You're right, I did. Upon him winning that WBC interim title in the lopsided beating he put on Brian Mendoza, I said, interim title or no interim title, that fight ain't happening. That fight ain't getting ordered between him and Sebastian Fundora. Nope. And that was well before any of this news broke. That was before any of this happened. So what should he do? Move up to 160 pounds. Move up the middleweight. The middleweight division needs a shot in the arm badly. Exciting fighters and fresh faces that can put on a show. And that's Sergei Bohachuk. He could do very well for himself up there. He's big. He's big for 154. Big enough that he could fill out at 160. I believe that Sergei is with Tom Loeffler of 360 Promotions, who used to promote Gennady Golovkin many, many years ago. Tom's a good guy, but Tom by himself... He ain't got the juice. Maybe he should take Sergei to Eddie Hearn. And maybe they should ink a co-promotional deal, because to get Sergei the right fights at 160, they're gonna have to put some hustle behind that muscle. He's made for television. He's a fan-friendly fighter with a fan-friendly style that's not afraid to take one to give one, not afraid to make a fight of it. He's not gonna get a shot at the title at 154. I'm telling you that right now. He's wasting his time there. He should move up to 160, get in position to fight for a title at 160 where he might have more luck because the guys up there ain't got as much marquee value or as much protection. What are we talking about? An aging Arislandi Lara? Carlos Adames? God bless them both, but they ain't got no marquee value. You'd sooner get the alphabets to order a fight between you and them than you and the guys at 154. They've got their own thing going on. Like it or lump it. Upstairs at Super Middleweight, Canelo Alvarez versus William Skull purse bids are now scheduled for next month on the 6th. As Skull's team have requested immediate purse bids, fight has been ordered by the IBF as a mandatory defense for the undisputed champion, Canelo Alvarez. And if he wants to keep the red belt, if he wants to stay undisputed, he's got to play ball. The IBF have stripped him before. They stripped him down there at middleweight when he was unable to reach a deal with Sergei Didibianchenko, his then mandatory. That was years ago. Most people might have forgot. But the long and the short of it is that the IBF have stripped Canelo Alvarez of a title before. They may yet strip him of a title again if he doesn't deal with this guy. Now, most people, they don't want to see him deal with this guy. That's someone of Canelo Alvarez's stature. They want to see him in other fights. A Benavidez fight, maybe a Crawford fight. They don't want to see him in there with this guy. But here's the problem. David Benavidez is otherwise spoken for. Next month, he's fighting on the 15th against Oleksandr Vajdik. And we don't actually know if he's going to win that fight. Even if he does, we don't know if he'll be ready to fight as soon as September. If the goal is for Canelo to fight in September, the site of yet another Mexican holiday, we don't know that David would be ready to fight if he wins on that kind of notice because you have to remember he would have to drop back down. Don't. He would have to drop back down to 168 and he's not with Memo Heredia anymore. Can he even make that weight? After he fights Vajdik, if he's fortunate enough to win, can he get down to 168 by September? Questions that need answers. The same pertains to Terence Crawford. If the goal is for Canelo to return in September, one of his designated fight dates, well, he can't fight Crawford because Crawford's fighting the month before that. He's fighting in August oh. against Matrimor, which we just talked about. So he's stuck with this guy? The way I see it, the only way a William Skull fight would be permissible is if you don't bill it as a pay-per-view, if you don't bill it as a box office fight, because you shouldn't have to pay $80 to see that. I think some flexibility is required here. I think Canelo Alvarez should give back to his paying fans, his paying customers, that regularly purchase his box office fights by making this a regular fight. You're telling Canelo to take a haircut on the money? He's done it before. He's done it before in this exact same situation. In between unification matches with Callum Smith and Billy Joe Saunders, he took on his WBC mandatory challenger, Avni Yildirim. And he didn't get for the Yildirim fight what he got for the Smith fight 
or the Saunders fight. He took a haircut on the money because he knew. An Avni Yildirim fight is not a hot ticket. And neither is this. If you don't bill it as a pay-per-view, then it's okay. Then it's all right, because it's not a box office fight. This isn't box office worthy, but you do have to deal with this guy. He is your IBF mandatory challenger. So you get him out the way. Canelo Alvarez, year by year, has become a polarizing figure, an even more polarizing figure here and now, because so many people want so much from him, they're never satisfied, they're never happy. Even in a situation like this, where he's under orders to fight a mandatory, they're still gonna hold that against him, as if it's his fault. I don't think somebody of Canelo Alvarez's stature wants to be pestered with the likes of a William Skull. You know that the Saudis have some intention to make a fight between Canelo and Terence Crawford, which we talked about here on the channel, how Turkey Al Al Sheikh would have preferred that the sanctioning bodies kept the way clear for them to do that fight uninterrupted so that one undisputed champion could fight another. Well, if that's the case, then why are they trying to make Terence Crawford the mandatory for Spence versus Fundora? Well, maybe they want Terence to clean house at 154 before he moves up to 168. Maybe that's the way it is? I don't know, but this needs to be dealt with immediately. This William Skull situation needs to be dealt with now, and if it goes to a purse bid, who's gonna want to bid on that fight? Does PBC have the money to win the rights? Matchroom does, but is Matchroom interested in hosting such a fight? Because as stated, it's not a big money fight. It's not box office worthy, even if it is Canelo. I wanna charge people $80 to see this? The only way I see this being permissible is if they don't bill it as a pay-per-view, they give this one away, a thank you to the fans that isn't as hard on their wallets, en route to something bigger and something better, then it's all right. Canelo Alvarez has since amended what was a three-fight deal with the PBC to a one-off situation for Munguia. He's not tied down to them anymore, and he can go where he wants, so if he wants to go to Matchroom, he can. And for the undercard, well, I think it would be better if Matchroom promotes that show than the PBC, because what bodies would the PBC have available for a September fight date? So many of their fighters are all tied up in that August show. Questions that need answers. Reaction was, you know, I was on the fence of the fight coming out, you know, I didn't know who was gonna win, but, you know, being that he did win, you know, um, congratulations to him. I think the referee took away a knockout for him. You know, they always trying to save somebody. I'm not going to say who, but, uh, you know, congratulations to Yusik and um, and um, I wish you nothing but the best. The rematch, who knows? You know, it's all about what person bring what dog to the fight. You know, many times we have good days and we have bad days and you just never know, you know. Um, if I had to pick, I would, I would say Yusik. You know, um, but hey, let, let, let's see what happens. I agree with Deontay. I do. I think that Usyk was robbed of a knockout win over Tyson Fury. Having had enough time to reflect upon it and watch it back, the live broadcast, as well as several snippets of ringside footage from those who were there taking in all the action, I am of the opinion that it was Mark Nelson's intention to save Tyson Fury in that moment because in that moment, which was a critical moment, as he finally collapsed into the turnbuckle, Usyk was about to put him down. He wasn't going to stop. I've seen it. I've seen the live broadcast at least three or four times now, as well as ringside footage from several different vantage points from those who were there. And it looks a lot to me like Mark Nelson identified that situation as a situation where Fury's about to get put down. And if he gets put down, down, he won't be able to get back up because he's clearly on spaghetti legs. His equilibrium is off. It's all over the place. He's not defending himself. He's not punching. He's not blocking. He's just getting hit, smacked up from one side of the ring to the other, the other, and then the other. It was in the first Wilder fight, the very first one that was scored a draw, that some people felt that Tyson Fury was given too much consideration from referee Jack Reese, that they should have waved the fight off. I didn't agree with that because his eyes were still open. Granted that he was flat on his back, his eyes were still open and he popped back up and beat the count. Could Jack Reese have waved it off? He could have. But Fury had been doing so well up until that point, I at least then understood what consideration he got in that situation. Then the Otto Valine fight rolls around, 
And he's got a nasty cut, I mean, a real nasty cut. A gash that in most other situations would have got the fight stopped on cuts. But they didn't stop it, and I wasn't surprised. Perhaps I've been a boxing fan too long, it's made me cynical over time that as bad as the cut was, I wasn't expecting them to stop it, even though if that were any other fighter with that same kind of cut bleeding out, how Fury was bleeding out, I know they would have stopped it. But because it was Fury, he got special consideration. They weren't gonna let him lose to some unheralded Swede like Otto Valin. Then you look at this fight. This was a lot more brazen. For me, this takes the cake. For what felt like an eternity, Tyson Fury was getting ragdolled from one end of the ring to the other, then the other, and then the other, until he finally collapses in the corner. But he's not on his ass, and he's not on his back. His feet are still touching the ground. He's leaning on a turnbuckle. And you have to pay attention. Usyk wasn't gonna stop. He's got his hand cocked, ready to deliver another punch, and that's when Mark Nelson jumps in between them. That's when Mark Nelson decides to give him a standing eight count. That kept him in the fight. That standing eight count is what allowed him enough time to gather himself, get his legs back under him, at least long enough to survive the round. Look at it! Usyk's got Fury right where he wants him. He's got the left hand cocked with a clear shot at Tyson Fury. And what does Mark do? He stops Usyk in his tracks. He pulls him off of Fury. Why? Why? You let Usyk smack this guy up and down the ring from one end of it to the other and the other and the other up until this point. You see what's going on and you know what was about to happen. He would have landed that left hand. Fury would have collapsed. He would have hit the deck. He would have hit the ground. And if he does, he don't get back up. I'm telling you, the only reason... Fury finished that fight on his feet and went the distance is because Mark Nelson bailed him out in the ninth. You know that he wasn't even fully recovered in the 10th? He was still trying to get his legs back under him. So when Wilder says that Usyk was robbed of a knockout, that once again Tyson Fury was given special consideration. No, I don't always agree with things that Wilder says, the things that Wilder does, but I agree with him this time because that's how I see it. The only reason Fury survived is because Mark Nelson helped him survive. Anybody else under those same circumstances not named Tyson Fury taking that much punishment, they get waved off. Anybody else? I've seen fights stop for less. Much less than what Fury endured in that ninth round. But if he would have got knocked out, you know what? What? There wouldn't have been nothing left of this guy to bring to a rematch. And he seems to want one. That's the story. He's activated his rematch clause. So bring it on, fat boy.